2 Kings chapter 8, starting with verse 7. Let's go. The Bible says, Elisha went to Damascus. Elisha went to Damascus, and Benadad, king of Aram, was ill. When the king was told, the man of God has come all the way up here, he said to Hazael, take a gift with you and go meet the man of God. Consult the Lord through him. Ask him, will I recover from this illness? Will I recover from this illness? Haziel went to meet Elisha, taking with him a gift, 40 camel loads. Think about this, 40 camel loads of all the finest wares of Damascus. He went in and stood before him and said, Your son, Benadad, king of Aram, has sent me to ask, Will I recover from this illness? Elisha answered, Go and say to him, You will certainly recover. You will certainly recover. Nevertheless, the Lord has revealed to me that he will in fact die. He stared at him with a fixed gaze until Haziel was embarrassed. Then the man of God began to weep. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this precious opportunity we have to be in your presence. We ask for your spirit to fall upon us right now. We want our hearts to be touched. Make this our reality in Jesus' name. Remember, we just left off in chapter 7 that after the Aramean army had been shown such grace in chapter 6 and 7. Remember the story from a couple weeks ago when they wanted to kill Elisha because Elisha was always revealing the plans of the king of Aram, always revealing King Benadad's plans of, of destruction and malice so that Israel could always avoid his snares. Remember this story? So the king then sends his best soldiers to kill Elisha, and they surround the town of Dothan where Elisha is. And remember this, Elisha tells his servant Gehazi, he says, we have more on our side than the enemy has on theirs. Gehazi was able, through God's providence, to see the hillsides covered with horses and chariots of fire, angels protecting them with swords. And then the, then the, the, uh, Aramean army comes to forward to attack Elisha, and he, they're blinded. Remember, Elisha says, the path that you want to be on, the person you want to meet, the city you want to go to is not this one, but I will take you to him. I will take you to the city. I will put you on the right path. And he takes this blinded army all the way into the city of Samaria where the Israelite army was. And you remember the story very well because Elisha then prays, Lord, open their eyes. And when they open their eyes, they see that they're surrounded by the Israelite army. Now, we already know what should have happened. They should have been dead. They had been bullying Israel for years, and now God has them within his grasp. God doesn't bless ugly. We know this, right? That's somewhere in the Bible. God doesn't bless ugly, and so we know God is going to make sure justice is served. Instead, there is grace. The king asks Elisha, shall we kill them? He says, no, don't even harm the hair on their head. Give them something to eat, give them something to drink, and send them back home to their king. And the response to this act of mercy initially is good. It says from that point on, they stopped raiding Israel. Until the very next verse, it says sometime later, they laid siege to the city, trying to starve it to death. They're trying to kill God's people, and, and, and if, it, if it weren't for God intervening, they would have succeeded. So now that the king is sick, now that the king is afraid for his life and finds out that Elisha is just strolling through the neighborhood, he's now inquiring of God and the man of God. Now, yo, weren't you just trying to kill him? And, and, and after so many acts of mercy, because God could have killed you while you laid siege to the, the city of Samaria, but God just allowed you to hear a sound that scared you and you fled back home, safely fled back home. And now that you're sick, you want to come to God. Now that you're sick, now, now Elisha's your father. Oh, your humble servant, I'm just your son. Please tell me, will I recover? Now see, these are the moments I'm telling you, you better be glad I'm not God. Because I would let you know about yourself. 
I would say, you got some nerve after harassing my people, after torturing my people, after bullying them around, you now want to ask for a favor. So here's Elisha who hears the request from the king, and what is his response? He will surely recover. There goes God again. Don't you want God at some point to stop being so nice? Don't you want God at some point to put his foot down and say enough is enough? Don't you want God at some point to say, I am too holy for this? Y'all going to get exactly what you deserve. But God is the same today as he was yesterday. When people talk about God not being merciful in the Old Testament, this is the Old Testament. In fact, this is smack dab in the story of the kings when some of the worst things were happening in the history of Israel. And God is still merciful. God is still gracious. He says, you will recover. You will recover. So we know from this text that God's will is that King Benadad recovers from his illness. And I'm going to tell you something that, again, will feel like it doesn't quite fit our narrative of eschatology. It doesn't quite fit the plagues we read about and the bowls of judgment we read about in Revelation. Even in the end, God is merciful and gracious. According to Revelation, God is holding back the winds of strife. Even when we read in Revelation all of these things that fall upon the people, it is never coming from God. God has always held back wickedness. You don't believe me? The story in Genesis of the flood, what was that story truly about? Was it about world destruction or world preservation? Clearly, it's about world preservation. Because if he didn't want anyone to survive, that could have happened. In fact, he built a boat so, so the community could all join in. And if there were so many people that decided to join in on it that they didn't have enough room on the boat, guess who would have stopped the storm? God. He did it in the, in the, in the, in the, in the book of Jonah, right? He tells us in Jeremiah 18, if a wicked city that I say will be uprooted, repent, I will not bring about the disaster. That's the principle we find. God is always looking for opportunities to be merciful and gracious. And even those stories that look at first glance like God lost his temper, trust me, they are the most merciful, most gracious acts coming from our Redeemer and our Savior. He's always looking to preserve. But here in this situation, here in this situation, I kind of want Elisha to tell the king about himself, but he is still God's representative, and he is revealing and reflecting the character of God. Even in the end, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. We talked about this a few weeks ago. The only reason why the wicked are not allowed into his kingdom is for one reason and one reason alone. And it's not an arbitrary act we read. It's not an arbitrary act. It is for one reason alone. Because being in the very presence of God for the wicked would be a place of torture. And God doesn't want to hurt anybody. He's like, no, 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 no. I get it. I get it. I get it. I know why you're crying for the rocks to crush you. The only thing that can bring you peace right now is death. I'll leave you alone. But you know that when I leave you alone, you know what happens. You're like a branch that withers away. Not even at the end of time is God saying, justice will be served. There is no justice at the end of time. It is just mercy. It is mercy that those who believe will be saved, and it is mercy that those who do not believe will go to sleep forever. They will live in peace forever. Eternal sleep, eternal death, what the Bible calls the second death. If God really wanted to get even with the wicked, he'd crucify them. You don't like that picture? You prefer the one where people are burning forever and ever? Or how about the one where they burn for hours and hours and hours and hours because they were so bad and God must get even? You'd be surprised how much our denomination has shifted on the way they see this aspect of God. 
Even in one of our books, the, the exposition of the 27 fundamental beliefs, they, that the authors, the authors and editors said that it should be seen not in light of physical pain and suffering, but more of emotional. Just as Jesus suffered more emotional pain on the cross, because that is what sin is. It is the sense of eternal separation. Just as he experienced emotional and mental anguish, so shall it be for the wicked. If there is any measure of worse any measure of more, it is not something that God is inflicting. It is because the sin that is in them is just simply torturous. No arbitrary act on the part of God. God is not in the end saying, oh, you're going to nail me? All right, come on, give me some nails. We're going to see what's up. That would make God look petty, wouldn't it? Like a kid who picked up a rock because another child threw a rock at him. God is not like you. In fact, the Bible says in Isaiah 55, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways and thoughts above yours. And when we read that text, it's in the context of mercy. He says, come to me, all of you who have sinned, and I will freely pardon. I will freely forgive. It is in the context of, of grace and mercy. For my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is just who God is. So Elisha can't be anything other than who God is. He will, he will recover. Now, why would God want him to recover? Because God knows the only way to bring people to repentance is for him to be good. That's according to Romans chapter 2, verse 4. It is the goodness of the Lord that leads to repentance. Isn't that what the Bible says? It is the goodness of the Lord. Does it say it is the fear of the Lord that leads to repentance? No. Does it say it is the justice of the Lord that leads to repentance? It is the goodness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. If you believe that, say amen. I know some of you have come back to the Lord because you're afraid. If you've come back to the Lord because you fear, you're not coming for the right reason. God only draws in love. He only draws in love. For those of you who may have a hard time grasping that idea, think about it. Would you ever marry someone in fear? I know, maybe some of y'all have. Afraid of being alone, right? Afraid of not having enough. That might be your reason for, for marriage. But can you imagine if someone says, I want to be with you forever because I'm afraid. You don't want that, ladies. You want, you want that man to choose to be with you forever because he's in love with you. That's what you want. Come on, ladies, say amen to that. Like you, he's, like, he's like, Pastor, it's too late for that. I know. I know the truth. So this is just who God is, and he only draws in love. So he says he will recover. He will recover. Thank you, Lord, for being merciful. But watch what happens next. It then says, in fact, however, in fact, he's actually going to die. Now, does this sound like God is lying to you? He's going to recover. Well, maybe on second thought, no, he's not. No, he's going to recover from his illness. It is God's will that he recovers. It is God's will that is healed. But then Elisha gets some more data and goes, whoa, actually, although it is God's will that he is restored and that he is healed, what's actually going to happen is he's going to die. And then he begins to stare at Hazael. The Bible gives us this information that almost kind of makes me feel a little like the heebie-jeebies or something. It says he begins to stare at him to the point where the, the attendant of the, of, the, of the king, what I would think is probably a high-ranking official, begins to become embarrassed. Wait, why are you looking at me like that? Do I have something in my... Why are you... What, what's going on? My Lord, why are you looking at me like this? And Elisha begins to stare. He stares. And then suddenly his eyes begin to well up with tears. And the Bible says he begins to weep. My Lord, what's wrong? You're going to kill my people. You're going to kill our sons. You're going to dash our children on the rocks. You're going to rip open the bellies of our pregnant women. You are going to cause so much pain. You are going to hurt so many people. And he 
righteous be. No, my Lord, I would never do such a thing. I would never do such a thing. Not even if I have to die for you. I would never deny you. I would never betray you. Well, what does this all sound like? I would never, Lord. I would never, Lord. I would never, Lord. Honey, I would never do that. Honey, I, will, I don't care. I don't, I would, we're just friends. I would never. I would never. I would never. You know God knows you better than you know yourself. You know this, right? You know this. According to the scripture that we read in our responsive reading, David tells us in, in Psalm 139 that we were knitted together in the womb, that he knew our days even before we were born, that they, that they were ordained. He knows us in our innermost being, David says. That's why he says, search me, O Lord. God knows you. People a lot of times like to use this to comfort them. You know what, I, I'm, I'm just doing my life, but God knows my heart. And I'm like, yo, that's the problem. <laughs> he knows, knows your heart. Like just when you thought you were kind of good, he goes deeper than that and says, yeah. That's just a layer. If I go down five more layers, I know you'll be in the crowd one day saying, crucify. And this is the moment where I want to say, okay, if you know what, they're, what he's going to do, stop the evil. Elisha, call those she-bears. I'm sure they're still around in the woods. Right? Dr. Palmer, isn't this the time to call the bears? Isn't this the time to follow in the, his mentor's footsteps and call fire out of heaven and consume this wicked man right now? Stop him right in his, track, in his tracks. Burn him alive. Some would say, well, he hasn't committed the act yet, but God knows what he's going to do. And that's good enough for me. Kill that man. No. When God was creating Lucifer, knitting him together, I imagined him. beautiful you are going to be the death of me well God just stop no 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 don't just stop you don't have to keep creating him just stop it's not like anyone will know but he keeps knitting him together God is his own police. He has to continue to knit Lucifer together because that's what love does. Love doesn't play games. Love does not manipulate. And love puts itself in risk, the pathway of risk and heartache. How many of you would marry the person you married if you knew it was going to end in a divorce? How many? How many? Lord, please bring this person into my life. You prayed, you'd ask for signs, and God showed you everything you needed to know. And God is like there on the wedding day, and he's smiling and saying, oh, this is going to break your heart. Well, then Lord, then, then, then just tell me not to go through it. No, no, this is the person. Wait, what do you mean? This is the person. Your will is that we're happy and we live happily ever after. There is no way to avoid sin. And if you choose to love, authentically love, the way that God loves, there is no way to avoid choice. And what makes God's moves so incredible is that he actually knows before it happens and he still gets married to us. Oh, he says, you're going to be unfaithful to me. I do. Wow. 
You know, we talk about the plan of salvation. This always messes with me. From the foundations of the world, Jesus was slain. From the foundations of the world, as he's, as he's, as he's forming Adam in the dust, he's crying. No, Jesus, stop now because you made this mistake with Lucifer. You know how it ends. Stop it now. We know what God's will is. God's will is that nobody dies. God's will is that we all live. God's will is that joy is full and it's overflowing. That is God's will. God's will is that there's healing and there's restoration. Here's the problem. God has his perfect will. Sin has other plans. And as much as we would want only God's will to be done, on earth as it is in heaven, that is not how it works. That's why when you look at the story of Moses, it is all over the place. Yes, Moses eventually gets his people all the way to the promised land, but Moses doesn't go into the promised land with them. It did not go according to plan. Joseph did not go according to plan. Ruth did not go according to plan. Nothing in Scripture goes according to plan. Not even Calvary went according to plan. You're going to tell me, but there was a plan of salvation. You think that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all came together and said, hey, we should save them. How do you think we should do it? <sighs> I got a great idea. It's going to involve some cross beams and some nails. Good idea, bro. You think that's how they came up with it? Well, well, how are we going to get to the cross? I mean, we're going to have to inspire the Babylonians to invent it and then have the Romans perfect it. Yeah, don't worry. We'll make it happen. Holy Spirit, start doing your thing. The plan of salvation is not crucifixion. The plan of salvation is that God loved you to death from the very beginning. As he knitted you together, he already knew, he already knew, he already knew. And he said, I'm going to keep going because I love her, I love her, I love her. Now you're going to tell me, but pastor, there's prophecies. Yes, prophecies are not an indication of God's perfect will. Prophecies often are God saying, I know what you're going to do. Jesus didn't need a cross. He even tells us in the book of John, the gospel of John, chapter 10, no one takes my life. I give it up freely. I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it back. He didn't need a cross. He didn't need nails. He was dying in the garden of Gethsemane before anyone laid a finger on him. In the gospel of Luke, my spirit is sorrowful even unto death. He was already bleeding through his pores. But the plan of salvation was a plan that went wrong. Now, no, Lord, hear me, hear me, hear me. God does not plan Calvary. God does not plan the crucifixion, but God planned for it. He knew it was going down, and so he could speak about it. He could prophesy about it. We could read about it in the Old Testament. But let's go to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 21. Listen to what the Word of God says. Matthew 21. This is a parable. This is right before Jesus' passion experience. Right before. He's already triumphantly come into the city. This is right before. Right before. And Jesus preaches this message. Matthew 21, verse 35. It is about, it is about the, the parable of the tenants, about a master who goes to live somewhere else, but he leaves his property in the care of these tenants. They are renting it. They are not owners of it. They're simply caring for it. And when the harvest comes, the owner says, I want to get what is mine. But when the tenants see his servants coming, what do they do? Verse 35 says the tenant seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son. And what does it say? They will what? They will respect my son. You want to know God's perfect will? Right here. They will respect my son. Oh no, pastor, the foreshadowing, the sacrificial system. The sacrificial system did not involve lambs being nailed to a cross. If we had ever seen one of those sacrifices, you would know the care that the priest would take in caring for the animal. It would be painless for them. 
Even the foreshadowing of Abraham and Isaac. Did Abraham scourge his son before he laid him onto the altar? Israel could have accepted Jesus, the Son of God. He still would have been laid on an altar. He still would have given up the Spirit and said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He still would have given his life because no one took it from him to begin with. It just didn't have to be bloody and gory. We are the ones who said, crucify him. You will one day kill our sons, kill our women, kill our children. And God weeps. And all throughout Scripture, God weeps. He's sorry he made man in Genesis 6. He weeps. Jesus looks over Jerusalem and he weeps. He's before Lazarus' tomb, the shortest verse in the English Bible. Jesus wept because sin hurts. And when things don't go according to plan, You know what they say about the best laid plans. In God's case, the best laid plans did not go according to plan. It required Jesus laying down on the cross. What I love about the story of Calvary is not so much that Jesus gave his life, because he could have done that in a rocking chair, and he still would have redeemed me. And he still would have felt the awful sense of separation from God. What I love about the story of Calvary is that even when he knew it would not go according to plan, God was still going to be at his best. He was still going to love me through it all. He could look at me and know I was going to divorce him, no, I was going to deny him and say, I still want you. But you're going to leave me tonight, too. But I still want you. Judas, you're going to leave me. I still love you. That's why I wanted to wash your feet and eat with you one more time. But I know what you're going to do, so do it quickly. Just go. Jesus weeps. I know you want God to stop evil. I know you wish that you weren't in the circumstances that you're in. I know right now you wish that God could just make all things new. Not now. Right now is the time for mess. Right now is still a time of brokenness. Right now is still a time of choice. And we have chosen to be in a world that is just wrought with plans that go wrong. How many of you are here because the plans went wrong? Some of you are supposed to be in New York right now, but that business failed, and now you're back in California living with your parents. But can I tell you about the best laid plans? Can I tell you what happens even when our plans go awry, even when our plans fail, even when that perfect ending doesn't really end perfectly? God still finds himself in the midst. And we can look at the cross that was really a symbol of shame, and, 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 and Paul will say, nah, 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 nah. I know this might be a stumbling block for you, but I only want a glory in Jesus Christ and him crucified. It is Jesus at the end of that parable, that end of the parable of the tenants, the end of the parable of the tenants, it is Jesus' own words. He says this, have you never read the scriptures in verse 42? Have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. God has a way of taking our, our messed up plans, our failed attempts, and knows how to make something good out of something that was really bad. The stone that was rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is why Romans tells us in chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. So even Moses, when it doesn't go according to plan, God still plans for you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, as we close. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witness, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, 
the author and finisher of our faith. He going to finish it. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. For the joy set before him. Oh, family, what was that joy? Who was that joy? You are his joy. It didn't go according to plan, but he kept thinking about you. So as he was knitting us together and he was crying, he still could look beyond. And I love Christ. He doesn't just stop at the cross. He goes beyond the cross. He sees that three days later, he will rise again. And he doesn't just stop there with his resurrection. He looks towards our resurrection. So he won't give up. He says, I'm going to keep going and I'm going to persevere. Because in all of the malaise and all of the heartache, there is still something so good. I can now, from where I am, Thank God for those Calvary moments. And some of you in this, in this congregation, some of you know me well enough to know there were times I felt like I was on a cross and there was no way off it. But now, coming through it, I can look back and be thankful for those moments. Because I see God in a different way. I can be like Job and say, in the past I had only heard of you, but now I have seen you, so I repent. So Lord, I don't care what the best laid plans are. If at the end the plan is to see you, I'm in on it. I'm there for it. Bring it on. Devil, bring your worst. I am there because in the end if I can see Jesus, I'm sorry I'm preaching, I'm being a little too loud. But if in the end I can see Jesus, it has all been worth it. If in the end I am able to understand love in a greater way, to a greater degree, to greater depth, it's worth it. So yes, yes, if I had to do it all over again, I would still choose the same Calvary moment because it's what led me to my son. And I know that God has more. There will be a better day. So Elisha didn't kill Haziel, no, no, no. He could weep because sin hurts, but Elisha saw beyond this moment. And he knew that God would redeem. There will be a better day, family. There will be a better day. There will be a better day.